Police have promised to crack down on protesters who've been abusing and intimidating MPs at Westminster in the run-up to next week's Brexit vote. Theresa May is facing growing pressure from members of her own cabinet to rule out Britain leaving the EU without a deal. The mayor of Ostend in Belgium has warned that a British plan for a sea freight service in the event of a no-deal Brexit would be impossible to run by the end of March. Heathrow has suspended departures this evening because of a drone sighting. A court has ruled the Scottish government's handling of sexual misconduct allegations against the former First Minister Alex Salmond was unlawful. The Metropolitan Police have promised to deal robustly with any protesters who harass and abuse MPs at Westminster. The force was responding to mounting calls from MPs who've expressed alarm at an increasingly threatening atmosphere outside Parliament as the Brexit process reaches a climax. In the latest incident yesterday, the Conservative backbencher and Remain supporter Anna Soubry was verbally abused by protesters who called her a Nazi and a liar. In the Commons, the Speaker John Burko demanded the police deal with what he called aggressive and intimidating behaviour, saying the group of small but vocal demonstrators represented a type of fascism. It is frankly intolerable if members of Parliament and journalists go about their business in fear. This situation cannot stand. I have written with force, passion and politeness to the Commissioner of the Metropolitan Police seeking a review of policy. The appeal comes as Westminster prepares for the crucial vote next week on Theresa May's Brexit withdrawal bill. Tonight it's emerged that new security advice has been issued to MPs. From Westminster, here's our Home Affairs correspondent, Danny Shaw. Over the past two and a half years, there's been impassioned debate on both sides of the Brexit divide, among MPs and members of the public. Outside the Houses of Parliament, police have tried to allow the voices of protest to be heard, anxious not to be seen to be stifling free speech. But in the past few months, the tone has become more shrill and hostile. Yesterday, as Anna Soubry was being interviewed in a cordoned-off media area opposite the House, a group of pro-Brexit campaigners tried to drown her out. Later, as the Conservative MP made her way to the Commons, she was surrounded by a group of men who appeared to block her path in front of police officers. Why are you special that you shouldn't be confronted by the public, Anna? But her voice is worth more than 17.4 million. It's Femi, isn't it? It's not Lammy. I do apologise. Anna, please, Anna. After the footage was broadcast, politicians on all sides condemned what had happened. Theresa May's official spokesman said she told Cabinet colleagues it was not how debate should be conducted in Britain. The Labour MP Jess Phillips recalled the murder of her parliamentary colleague Joe Cox by a far-right activist three years ago and said the demonstrators were trying to silence them. These people, they are trying to frighten us so that we do something different, so that when I'm reminded that my friend was murdered in the street, that maybe I won't come on the television and talk about it. They're trying to scare us. More than 100 MPs signed a letter to the Metropolitan Police Commissioner Cressida Dick, claiming there'd been a lack of coordination by the authorities in their handling of what they said was the deteriorating public order and security situation outside Parliament. The Met responded by drafting in extra officers and promising to deal robustly with anyone who breaks the law. Deputy Assistant Commissioner Lawrence Taylor said Brexit was a challenging issue for the police and he acknowledged improvements were needed. We've reviewed the policing uh, down at Westminster. Um, I've given very clear direction to officers that if substantive offences are witnessed at the scene, I do expect arrests to be made uh, and I do expect us to intervene if people are prevented from going about their daily business. Anna Soubry said she wouldn't be deterred by what had gone on and claimed those involved in the protests were a small group of far-right extremists. In a democracy, we want people to be able to speak to their politicians and we want people to be able to protest. What's been happening has gone way beyond that, but it's a minority. Tonight, as the Tory MP made her way to the Houses of Parliament, there was strong support from Remain campaigners. For she's a jolly good fella, for she's a jolly good fella. 
Police say there have been no arrests so far, but they're continuing to review the incidents and take legal advice as to whether crimes have been committed. MPs are due to vote within the next hour on a measure designed to thwart Theresa May's preparations for Britain leaving the European Union without a deal. The cross-party amendment to the finance bill is being seen as a symbolic challenge to Theresa May by those MPs who want her to rule out the prospect of Britain leaving without an agreement if her own deal is defeated in the Commons in a week's time. Here's our assistant political editor, Norman Smith. Theresa May is now facing a growing revolt at Westminster over her willingness to consider a no-deal Brexit should her agreement be voted down. Already more than 200 MPs from different parties have called on the Prime Minister to rule out such an option. But significantly today, a series of senior cabinet ministers appeared to join in the opposition. At cabinet this morning, it's understood the Work and Pension Secretary, Amber Rudd, said history would take a dim view of the government if it accepted no deal, while the Home Secretary, Sajid Javid, said no deal would limit the government's ability to return illegal immigrants to other EU countries. And in the Commons, the Business Secretary, Greg Clark, issued this warning. It is essential uh, that we should be able to continue to trade. It's why I've always been clear, representing very strongly the views of small business uh, and large business, that no deal uh, should not be contemplated. This followed an earlier warning from the business minister, Richard Harrington, that he and other ministers could quit if there was no deal. While the former Attorney General, Dominic Grieve, a prominent opponent of Mrs May's Brexit plan, predicted no deal would lead to the collapse of the government. I don't see how the government would survive such a process. I think it would simply founder. I think ministers would resign and ultimately the government would lose its parliamentary majority. And in a further sign of the growing opposition to No Deal, the government is tonight facing possible defeat in the Commons after a revolt led by leading Tory and Labour backbenchers over No Deal planning. Number 10 sought to play down the move as insignificant, but Brexiteers reacted with anger. The former Brexit minister, Suella Braverman. No deal has to be an option on the table for many reasons, not least for our negotiating strength with the EU, but also that it might be the ultimate outcome if the Prime Minister's deal is rejected by the Commons next week. And the government needs maximum flexibility to prepare to do what it has to do to make sure the country, businesses, individuals are in the best position for no deal. The widespread and growing opposition to No Deal, including in Tory ranks, suggests the Prime Minister would face a major revolt, including among Cabinet Ministers, should she indeed seek to take Britain out of the EU without an agreement. New questions have been raised about one of the ferry company contracts signed by the government to alleviate any delays that might result from a no-deal Brexit. Labour have accused ministers of failing to carry out adequate checks on the business experience of the directors of the firm Seaborne Freight. Criticism had already been raised because the firm has never operated ferries before. Here's our transport correspondent, Tom Burridge. The Department for Transport's £14 million contract with Seaborne Freight has been dogged by controversy since it was announced. Today, the company, which plans to run a ferry service for lorries from Ramsgate in Kent to Ostend in Belgium, to ease pressure at Dover if Britain leaves the European Union without a deal, faced further scrutiny. This was the response of the Mayor of Ostend, Bart Tomalane, when the BBC asked him if the port in his city would be ready to receive ships by the end of March. No, that's impossible. Uh, we are interested in a ferry line. Uh, we have a, a positive attitude uh, because uh, we have a harbour and the harbour uh, needs uh, traffic. That's normal. But uh, there are some inconveniences and uh, also some uh, investments to do in our harbour, in the harbour of Ramsgate. And also we need some guarantees about the profitability of uh, this ferry line and uh, the solvency of uh, this company. And this afternoon in the Commons, opposition parties grilled the Transport Secretary on whether his department had properly vetted Seaborn's directors, after it emerged that two of them had previously run companies which had gone bust. One of the liquidated firms in question still owes the UK tax authorities nearly £600,000. 
Labour's Shadow Transport Secretary is Andy Macdonald. This is a shoddy and tawdry affair and the Secretary of State is making a complete mess of it. This contract is very likely unlawful and violates every current best practice guidance issued by Whitehall. The Transport Secretary Chris Grayling said Seaborne Freight would only receive government money if and when ferries ran. That is responsible stewardship of public money. Other matters, there are no reasons in the due diligence we have done to believe that any of those involved in this business are not fit to do business with government. It's also emerged that research commissioned by the government in 2017 found that an extra 70 second check on each lorry at Dover would cause queues of six days at the border. The Department for Transport said the study carried out by University College London had been superseded by more recent analysis, which was less stark. Will my travel be affected when we leave the EU? Today, government radio adverts aired, encouraging people to wise up about the implications of Britain leaving the European Union without a deal. Find guidance and up-to-date information at gov.uk slash EU exit. In the past hour, Heathrow Airport has suspended all takeoffs because of reported sightings of a drone near one of the runways. In a statement, the airport said it was working closely with the Metropolitan Police to prevent any threat to operational safety. It's not clear how many aircraft are affected. More details from our correspondent, Ben Ando. Heathrow says it suspended takeoffs while police investigate. Several passengers on board jets at Heathrow, Europe's busiest international airport, have tweeted to say that their flights are unable to leave and pilots explained it was due to drone activity. Heathrow has two runways. The one closed is understood to be the north. The south runway is still open, enabling incoming flights to land. Last month, reports of drones led to chaos at Gatwick Airport when its runway was closed intermittently over a three-day period, causing delays for thousands of people just before Christmas. A judge has ruled that the Scottish government acted unlawfully while investigating sexual harassment claims against the former First Minister Alex Salmond. The Scottish government has admitted that it breached its own guidelines by appointing an investigating officer who had prior involvement with the case. Mr Salmond has always denied the claims. The current First Minister, Nicola Sturgeon, said the outcome was deeply regrettable. Our Scotland editor Sarah Smith reports. Complaints of sexual misconduct were made against Alex Salmond by two women last year, dating back to his time as First Minister of Scotland. Those allegations were investigated by the Scottish Government, but their conclusions have not been published, and now they never will be, as the Scottish Government has been forced to admit it breached its own guidelines while investigating the complaints. According to the judge, Lord Pentland, that meant the inquiry was unlawful, unfair and tainted with apparent bias because the investigating officer had substantial contact with the women who complained about Mr Salmon's behaviour before the investigation began. Speaking to reporters outside the court of session in Edinburgh, Mr Salmon described the decision as an abject humiliation for the Scottish Government. The last time I was in that court, it was to be sworn in as First Minister of Scotland. I never thought it possible that at any point I'd be taking the Scottish Government to court. Mr Salmon's case focused on points of procedure. The details of the allegations against him were not considered in court. The First Minister, Nicola Sturgeon, says she wants to apologise to the women who raised the complaints. It's deeply regrettable that we're in the situation we're in today, not least for the complainants who had a right to expect that this process would be in every respect uh, robust. Uh, and of course, the Scottish Government will seek to learn any lessons from that. The Scottish Government say they may reopen the investigation into Mr Salmond, but not before ongoing police inquiries have concluded. This case could cost the government up to half a million pounds, as they will now have to pay most of Mr Salmond's legal costs he had raised £100,000 through online crowdfunding to pay for his legal action. Any money left over, he says, will go to good causes in Scotland. President Trump is expected to tell Americans later that the country faces a humanitarian and security crisis on its border with Mexico. He will address the nation from the Oval Office and, once again, urge the Democrats in Congress to approve funds for the security barrier he wants to build. The dispute has led to a partial shutdown of the federal government, which is now in its third week. There's been speculation that Mr Trump might declare a state of emergency to try to bypass Congress. Our, con our correspondent, Gary O'Donoghue, reports from Washington. 
All the major TV and cable networks will carry the president's address, which White House officials say will last for around eight minutes. What is clear is that it will be a determined attempt to persuade American voters that there is a national emergency on the southwest border. Currently, a majority of them do not support the idea of a wall and blame Republicans and Donald Trump for the partial government shutdown. What is less clear is whether the president will announce a plan to invoke emergency powers which could allow him to direct money and manpower to the construction of the wall without congressional approval. The vice president, Mike Pence, set out the administration's argument. Nearly 60,000 people over the past several months have attempted to come into our country illegally and it simply is overwhelming the ability of our Customs and Border Patrol to deal with it. Add to that human trafficking, the flow of narcotics, then the American people will hear from the president tonight that we have a crisis. Mr Pence and other members of the administration have been severely criticised by Democrats for using misleading numbers for suspected terrorists trying to enter the country illegally from Mexico. The vast majority of those on watch lists try to gain access to the US via airports. And most of those in the country illegally enter legally and then overstay their visas. But numbers aside, this is as much about winning the rhetorical argument, one which, given the wall's importance to many of his supporters, the president can't really afford to lose. You're listening to the Six O'Clock News on BBC Radio 4. The main news so far, the Metropolitan Police has announced it will take robust action to stop the harassment of MPs at Westminster. Heathrow has suspended departures this evening in response to a drone sighting. Still to come... The interior can be cleaned. If there's plaster need to remove, wood door frames, they can all be done quite simply and safely. Work begins to dismantle part of Sergei Skripal's house in Salisbury. One of the migrants to have crossed the English Channel on a dinghy in recent months has been speaking to the BBC about his journey. Just yesterday, eight more migrants were found following the discovery of an empty boat on a beach near Kent. Mohamed Salahi, who's Iranian, has warned others against making the same crossing. Our special correspondent, Lucy Manning, has been to Liverpool to hear his story. Mohamed Salahi is one of more than 500 people who made the dangerous journey in small boats across the sea to Britain from France last year. The Iranian political activist claims he was imprisoned by the Iranian regime for four years. He arrived in Britain in October after a journey across the Channel. He says he paid smugglers €3,000 and some in the boat fainted as they were hit by large waves. He's now warning others not to make the same journey. I tell anyone thinking about coming this way to be aware it is not easy. It is really dangerous. There were big waves coming from every side, throwing us around. The cold weather has come, so we say on Facebook and Instagram, don't choose this way. The Iranian has now claimed asylum in Britain, but also applied in France, where he was rejected. He claims France isn't sympathetic to political cases of Iranian migrants. The Home Secretary, Sajid Javid, told the Commons last night the Home Office should try to limit the claims of those who travel from safe countries like France. Mr Salahi thinks more are coming by small boats across the channel because the people smugglers have realised this is a route that works. A former youth football coach has died in a car crash on the day he was due to stand trial for historical sexual abuse. Michael Carson's car hit a tree yesterday morning. Mr Carson, who was 75, had been facing allegations involving 11 boys under the age of 16. Our sports correspondent Richard Conway sent this report from Peterborough Town Court. Michael Carson, better known as Kit, worked for many years at Peterborough United, Cambridge United and Norwich City as a football coach, helping to develop a string of leading players. He was due to stand trial on 12 counts of indecent assault and one of inciting a child to engage in sexual activity, which allegedly took place between 1979 and 2009. He had pleaded not guilty at an earlier hearing. But Peterborough Crown Court was told today Mr Carson died yesterday morning when the car he was driving left the road and hit a tree around seven miles east of Cambridge. No other person or vehicle was said to be involved. Judge Matthew Lowe ruled that the case file against Mr Carson would therefore be closed. 
A German man has admitted illegally publishing the personal data of around a thousand politicians and public figures, including the Chancellor Angela Merkel. The man was arrested on Sunday but released last night. Police said they had no evidence of his political leanings, but the hacking targeted all parties except the far-right alternative for Germany. Damien McGuinness reports from Berlin. The suspect is a 20-year-old German man from the western state of Hesse who still lives with his parents. He appears to have been acting on his own and is thought to have taught himself how to hack his victims' emails and social media accounts. Throughout 2018, he gathered vast amounts of data and in December started releasing it online. But he was less good at creating a buzz around the hack. It wasn't until last week that officials noticed what was going on. Around a thousand German politicians, journalists and celebrities were targeted, including the Chancellor Angela Merkel. The suspect says he chose his victims simply because they annoyed him. Most of the data contained contact information such as addresses, emails and phone numbers. But in some cases, more private details were also published, including bank statements, family photos and private correspondence. So far, the data breach hasn't led to any major problems or uncovered any scandals, but it has sparked a national debate about cyber security. If one inexperienced young man sitting in his bedroom can gather and release so much personal information, there are worries about what malevolent hackers or criminal gangs could do. The Turkish President Recep Tayyip Erdogan has severely criticised suggestions by the US National Security Advisor John Bolton that Turkey should protect Kurdish fighters after America withdraws its troops from Syria. Turkey supports President Trump's decision to pull out but regards the US-backed Kurdish forces as terrorists. From Washington, here's Barbara Pletasha. The United States has about 2,000 special operations forces in northeastern Syria, directing the ground war against Islamic State militants. Their local allies are Syrian Kurdish fighters who have helped push the group out of nearly all the territory it once held. But President Trump's surprise decision to withdraw the U.S. troops has created complications. He apparently accepted a Turkish offer to take over the mop-up operation against IS remnants in the wake of a U.S. military exit. Turkey, however, sees America's Kurdish allies as terrorists, and there's concern in Washington that without U.S. protection, the Turks would go after them. So John Bolton has said Turkey must guarantee their safety before any U.S. withdrawal. This new condition infuriated Turkey's president, Recep Tayyip Erdogan. It was not the plan he believed he'd agreed with President Trump. John Bolton, çok ciddi bir yanlış yapmıştır. John Bolton has made a serious mistake. It's not possible for us to make compromises on this point. Those who are part of the terror corridor in Syria will receive the necessary lesson. Mr. Bolton did not get a meeting with the Turkish president, but a U.S. official suggested he was forthright with Turkish officials, calling Mr. Erdogan's recent opinion piece about Turkey's plan to stabilize Syria wrong and offensive. There are also other issues behind the confusions and tensions over U.S.-Syria policy. Senior advisers like Mr. Bolton and the Secretary of State Mike Pompeo see U.S. military involvement as a way to help counter Iran's influence in Syria. This is also Israel's focus, that a U.S. withdrawal would open up space for Iran. But it's not clear that Mr. Trump shares this concern. He's always wanted to just defeat the Islamic State group and get the hell out. For the Pentagon, however, Mr. Trump's declaration of victory is premature. They say Islamic State militants are still a threat and could regroup. They're also skeptical that the Turkish military has the capability to effectively replace U.S. troops. Mr. Trump has eased up on his talk of an imminent departure for now, but his focus on bringing the troops home has jolted a complex web of regional alliances and competitions. The North Korean leader Kim Jong-un is visiting China amid speculation that his talks in Beijing are part of preparations for a second summit with President Trump. It's thought Mr Kim and his wife attended a dinner hosted by the Chinese President Xi Jinping and the First Lady. A correspondent in Beijing, John Sudworth, sent this report. It was quite a send-off. Kim Jong-un boarded his bulletproof train in Pyongyang, accompanied by a military honour guard and the usual adoring state media commentary. He arrived in Beijing on his birthday. Professor Chung Xiao He from the School of International Studies at Renmin University says Mr Kim won't be given any unpleasant surprises. China would encourage North Korea to give up the nuclear weapons, but uh, not necessarily push North Korea 
into a corner. Why? Because you see, in the past years, China believed if the pressure is too high, that will, will be counterproductive. The US has no such qualms. With preparations underway for a second Trump-Kim summit, the frequency of Kim Jong-un's trips to China underlines the importance of the bond and signals that North Korea has other options if the negotiations fail. It has long used its nuclear weapons to play the big powers off against each other, precisely the reason, some argue, it's unlikely to ever give them up. In the city, the 100 share index closed up 51 points at 6,862. In New York a short time ago, the Dow Jones was down 145 points at 23,676. On the currency markets, against the dollar, the pound was down a fifth of a cent at $1.27.3. Against the euro, the pound was unchanged at €1.11.2, making a euro worth 89.9 pence. Work has begun to dismantle and rebuild the roof of the house in Salisbury, where the former Russian spy Sergei Skripal lived before he was poisoned with the nerve agent Novichok last March. The operation is part of the clean-up following the attack, which has been blamed on two members of Russia's military intelligence service. Richard Galpin reports. Once scaffolding has been put up to cover the house, military teams will start dismantling the roofs of both the house and the garage. There are still thought to be traces of the nerve agent Novichok, which was initially smeared on the handle of the front door by the two Russian spies. The exposed timber in the roofs is absorbent and could pose a risk, so all the parts which are taken down will be carefully sealed and removed from the area. Local officials stress there is no risk to neighbours. The work's expected to last around six weeks, after which builders will be brought in to replace the roofs. Alistair Cunningham of Wiltshire Council says there's no need to demolish the house. The interior can be cleaned. If there's plaster need removed, wood door frames, they can all be done quite simply and safely. We're simply doing what's necessary. To knock down the house would be a huge cost. It would send a message that this is far more invasive poison than it actually is. For security reasons, it's highly unlikely Mr Skripal will return to his house, so it may be put on sale. Although the council says it may buy it to prevent any possibility of it being used as a bizarre kind of tourist attraction. The former Spurs and England footballer Paul Gascoigne has pleaded not guilty to sexually assaulting a woman on a train between York and Newcastle last August. He was granted unconditional bail at Teesside Crown Court until a trial in October. The Irish golfer Podrick Harrington has been chosen as Europe's new Ryder Cup captain. He takes over from Denmark's Thomas Bjorn, who led the European team to victory over the United States in France last autumn. Europe will attempt to defend the trophy in Wisconsin next year. Here's our golf correspondent, Ian Carter. Podrick Harrington was the natural choice to take over as captain. The 47-year-old from Dublin has enjoyed a glittering playing career in which he won three major titles, including two Open Championships. Harrington has played in six Ryder Cups and was a vice-captain in each of the last three contests. Although he's been the leading candidate for the role for some time, Harrington admitted he had to think long and hard before accepting the appointment. I sat down and thought about this. Do I want to put myself out there? Do I want to take this chance? And I've always been prepared to do that on the golf course. Uh, this is a little different in the challenge, but yeah, I, I, I want to take that chance of being a successful captain. I'm prepared to put my uh, legacy somewhat on the line. His appointment has been widely welcomed, with Europe's top player Justin Rose leading the congratulations. But Harrington faces one of the toughest challenges in golf, to win an away match in the Ryder Cup. Next year's event will be played on the banks of Lake Michigan at Whistling Straits in Wisconsin. Europe last won away from home in 2012. America haven't won on their travels since 1993. It could be a joke from a Christmas cracker. How does a veterinary dentist earn his stripes? By treating a tiger with toothache. But at Paynton Zoo in Devon, one brave vet did just that. Fabby, an 11-year-old Sumatran tiger, underwent a two-and-a-half-hour root canal treatment. The anaesthetised patient was kept warm while his teeth, measuring more than three inches from root to tip, were drilled. To ensure the dentist also remained pain-free, he was accompanied by three vets, three nurses, two zookeepers, a senior and senior animal staff, one armed with a shotgun. 
The headlines again. Police have promised to take robust action against protesters who've abused and intimidated MPs at Westminster. A series of cabinet ministers have called on Theresa May to rule out a no-deal Brexit should her own plan be defeated next week. Heathrow Airport has suspended departures because of a suspected drone sighting. The government says the military are preparing to use specialist equipment if necessary. A judge has ruled that the Scottish government acted unlawfully while investigating sexual harassment claims against the former First Minister Alex Salmond. BBC News.